There's so much to explore here. I mean, if we wanted to, we could just go to math and be like, I want to multiply this by some special number such as, I don't know, the movement speed, for example. And then I want to put that into the playback speed. So if I now hit play and then I move and the animation speed actually plays a lot slower as well because it's dependent on movement. Welcome to another Hazel Devlog. It's just as in development as the engine itself. All right, what do I do this week? The first thing I want to mention is how, I mean, quite honestly blown away I was by the support on the I'm struggling video that I made. I think that because of the fact that my life has been a little bit stressful over the last six months, I was on a little bit of an autopilot, just making videos, like spitting out content, working on Hazel whenever I really could, which wasn't often. And I kind of forgot about all of you. I forgot about the fact that I have this community of people who like, I don't know, like me, is that weird to say? It seems weird to say. This amazing community of people who support me, who like my videos and support the Hazel project. I think it's a little cliche to say, but it's honestly true that when you make videos online or just any social media really, you kind of forget the people behind the numbers. You just see the numbers and it's like, okay, cool, check. Like this satisfied the business goals. I can put food on the table. And I guess because of the aforementioned autopilot state that I was in, I was kind of losing that that connection. So I just wanna say thank you. It was really nice reading all of your comments and I was a little bit surprised at how mature a lot of those comments were. Like these were not comments written by 15 year olds. There were a fair few comments written by people like in their 40s, in their 50s who had a lot of life experience and it was just so understanding about how, you know, when you grow up, like your responsibilities change, life changes. I mean, honestly, I think I'm gonna print out some of those comments and just frame them around the office because anytime I feel down or I feel unmotivated or I'm like, why am I even doing all of this? It would just be so cool to read words from the community. Now, the main topic of this video is going to be animation. And I'm gonna talk about that later in this video. But as this is like a weekly or so devlog, I do wanna to touch on the other things that I've been working on since animation is a feature that I haven't personally been working on. And it's also been around for a while. It's kind of like me catching up on, on things. And I think that honestly, I've got so much content in terms of devlogs for this year because there are so many features I haven't talked about and there's so much work that's happened behind the scenes that I haven't talked about. So I'm psyched about that. I hope you are as well. Me personally, what I've started trying to do is weekly live streams where I work on Hazel, on big Hazel, proper Hazel. There are still some things wrapping up that are somewhat preventing me from doing that consistently, but I'm really excited to very soon, hopefully, start doing that consistently every Monday night Australian time. I'm gonna try and do a big Hazel live stream, just a, a, just a dev stream really, where I just work on the engine. No pressure to make content specifically, it's just gonna be me programming, chatting to you guys in chat, that kind of thing. And so last time I did that, last Monday, was I worked on thumbnails in Big Hazel because this was a feature that I, well, I started, I have this thing, right, where I'll get really excited to do a feature in Hazel. And the thing is, Hazel is an engine, there are literally, like this is one of the things that I really love about game engines. The fact that almost any tech that you're interested in, either learning about or creating, you can probably somehow fit it into a game engine. So for example, oh, I'm interested in path tracing and offline rendering. Yeah, that, that belongs in a game engine, turns out as well these days. AI, you wanna learn about how to maybe make a neural network or do some kind of AI behaviors. Well, that's perfect for a game engine because then you can properly visualize it and maybe make some interactive experience out of it. Uh, I don't know, maybe you're interested in like geography and you wanna like create maps of the world. Well, yeah, you know, terrain system for a game engine, like massive maps, you probably see my point. Like you could honestly just anything you're interested in, like the crazy audio stuff Jay is doing as well, with like ray tracing and whatever, like that stuff. Yeah, exploring that tech also really fits well into a game engine. So it's almost like this kind of just massive tool of just every tech piece of technology you can really think of. And that's one of the reasons why I like game engines and I like working on them. But anyway, back to the original point, I have this tendency to one day wake up and be like, I wanna do this, I wanna explore this. And instead of me, you know, starting maybe a new project, which is what I would have done in the past for some of the things, 
I can just open up Hazel and be like, I'm just gonna do it straight inside Hazel. And the really cool thing about developing this code base, you know, because I've been working on Hazel for I think six years now. There's so much like API and tooling and stuff built into it that it's so much easier to just use Hazel almost as a framework, not really because I'm still building it into like the front facing user interface and I'm, I'm integrating it as a proper engine feature usually. However, the process of working on technology or you know, software will say inside Hazel is obviously very different than say raw C++. It's almost like Hazel is becoming a little bit of a language. And this happens with any large piece of technology. You know, going into Unreal Engine, for example, and doing A would be very, very different than going into C++ and just doing A. Because it's almost like, I mean, they have their own meta language. Hazel isn't isn't that advanced. But still having this, this library, this backing, this API and everything makes things very different. And so I'll wake up one day and I'll be like, I wanna implement this feature in Hazel. And then I'll spend a few days on it. And then I'll be like, oh, actually I really need to get that video done on time. So I'll just start working on the, the, the real work, we'll say that has a deadline. And then I'll forget about the feature and never return to it. And so I have about, I swear, 20, 30, just branches of Hazel, not even branches because I haven't committed any code, it's all local. Just like <laughs> copies of Hazel with like a one feature partially completed. Some of it's like, you know, 10% completed, some of it's 90% completed. And one of those features was thumbnails. About a year, year and a half maybe ago, I was like, yeah, you know, the content browser in Hazel just has icons, it's got no thumbnails. And so that is obviously a shame because when you're trying to preview a texture or a model or a material, like there's no way to do that at the moment. So I sat down, I started working on that and that feature was somewhat forgotten about for a year and a half. And because we started working on content browser thumbnails for Hazel 2D for the game engine series, I decided to revive the ones in Hazel 3D to kind of see, you know, what they were like, how I did that. It's a bit of a different ball game because in 2D really only what you have is, I guess, textures, images, that kind of thing. Whereas 3D, you've got materials, meshes, environment maps. You have to, in order to render, say a 3D mesh into a thumbnail, you have to like set up a scene inside Hazel with potentially an environment light or some kind of lighting, a camera that's positioned just in the right place so that you can generate a, an image, basically render an image of that mesh as it would appear in Hazel and then save that out to some kind of, maybe cache it into a file or just save it in memory as, a, as an image that you can then render onto that thumbnail in the content browser. So it's a bit of a process. Now, if you wanna see parts of this process, one thing I'm toying with the idea of is editing some of these live streams down and maybe including that, you know, the highlights maybe, or the fun bits of that process, or the informative bits, I don't know, as part of like a little bit of a cut that would go inside these devlogs. So let me know what you think of that idea. But yeah, Monday nights, Twitch or TV slash the channel, that's where these streams typically happen. I'm gonna try and do that as much as I can this year. And I think now we should talk about the very, very big, complex feature that is animation in Hazel. Sometimes it's really hard when there's a lot to show because I wanna show you guys everything. But the fact of the matter is a lot of these things that we work on, they are rather complicated. They have a lot of features, a lot of things you can do with them. I mean, it's a game engine. There's obviously a lot you can do, but I wanna keep things interesting for people. So what I'm about to show you is the latest edition of Hazel's animation system, skeletal animation system. This is something that Zero X or Jim has worked on for a very long time years, I think at this point. And it's obviously a very important system to have for a game engine. So what I wanna to do today is show you a little scene that we made, which uses this animation system for this main character over here. Now I would love to show you how to do all of this character animation in Hazel from scratch, but I worry that that would primarily be useful for people actually using Hazel. I don't know, maybe it would be nice for you guys to just see the workflow and see what it's like and see the system that we've built. Let me know in the comments below if that's something you're interested in seeing. But what I'll do today is we're just gonna take a look at this scene and I'm gonna kind of show you how it was put together. Maybe I'll edit it a little bit. I don't really have a plan for this to be honest. We're just gonna see what happens. So let me play the scene first so I can show you what this is. So WASD, as you would expect, uh, controls this character over here. We can walk around, we can jump with space. And the biggest uh, difference, I guess, with this scene compared to the animation system that we had, say last time I showed you animation in Hazel, is the fact that, well, visually what we can see here is just that these animations now blend together. So you can see that if I transition from, say, walking to stopping, or I jump, 
and then I land and you know, I can combine any, you know, I can run with shift and then I can jump and then I can kind of turn around and everything's just really, really smooth. Everything's like butter. There's no like snapping of animations together. So visually that's the biggest difference. But the other huge new change is the way that this scene is actually put together or specifically the way that these animations are put together. Before we take a look at how they're put together as well, I just want to mention that obviously this has a physics collider. Uh, in fact, I think if we hit Control P, I might have to actually change a setting over here. Okay, here we go. So this shows the actual physics collider. So you can see it's like a capsule collider and that's what encompasses this character. That's why we're on the ground. We're not falling through the ground. We can bump into things. We can also like climb this car, for example, if we struggle a little bit. So all of that, all of this is hooked in with the physics system. And the other important thing to note, I would say is root motion. So if you actually watch the feet of the character, you can see they align perfectly with the amount of distance the character travels. And that's because the amount of distance the character travels is actually tied in with the animation system. So it's not just us moving a capsule forward and then an animation playing, it's actually subject to that animation. So it's like, I don't know, there's lots of names for it, like emotion, root motion. It's just the idea that we have almost animation driven gameplay as opposed to just here's an animation playing and here's the actual character moving and interacting with the world, which is important. Obviously you wanna make some things animation driven and some things should not be animation driven. So it's good that we have this option. Okay, anyway, enough of like playing around with this scene. Let me show you how it was made and specifically, I guess, how the animation falls into this. So we have this character here. And again, I won't show you how to set this up from scratch. If you are interested in seeing that, let me know in the comments below and I'll make that in a future devlog. But over here, we have an animation component. This is just something that you can add through this. If you import this mesh and you want to import the animations that come with it, for example, you can also set up an entity that way. So you don't necessarily have to manually add all these components, obviously. But we have this animation component and inside here, we have an animation graph. So this is an actual asset. If I just search for say character, then you'll see that we have an animation graph. Here it is over here. So if I double click on this or this, doesn't matter, uh, we have this animation graph view. I'll dock it over here and hopefully my face cam won't get too much in the way. So this animation graph is definitely quite cool and I could, I could spend well over an hour talking about this stuff. So again, I will try and keep this brief. A quick note, you might notice that, that this UI is similar to, I don't know if we have any audio graphs here, but I'll try and put it up in post. The audio graph system that we had, the J made, that's because this is the same. So it's cool that we're able to reuse, you know, UI components and this whole kind of graph node compiler system for more than just audio. Audio. We're now using it for animation. I've got some plans to use it in the future, possibly in the distant future for things like render passes and custom rendering, all of that stuff. Maybe one day we'll use it for like a, a material system, like a shader system. But anyway, I just wanted to give a shout out to Jay because his system is obviously very, very useful to have. So over here, we have a state machine. If I just show you roughly how this is made, if we hit edit on the state machine. So we have like these different animation states. These two over here are basically called quick states. And then this one is kind of a full state, which has inside it, if we double click, another animation graph, which takes in an input as you can see and goes into a blend space which you can hit edit and control over here. So it's a decently complicated and thus flexible system which is pretty cool. The, the breadcrumbs are up here so you can go back to wherever you need to go to. And then we have these transitions between states. So you can see for example that character idle will go to and from movement depending on a particular characteristic which is this movement speed in this case being greater than zero. If it's greater than zero it will transition from character idle to movement because we need to start moving and vice versa it will transition transition back to character idle if the movement speed is less than or equal to zero. There's also this transition duration. It just means that we can control how long it takes to transition between say two different animations. And this can obviously be hooked up into whatever other node we want. But as an example, if I go to the movement one, here's the transition to movement to character falling. Uh, actually, I think this one would be better to change. So for example, this transition between being idle, which is where we currently are and falling, which is that like I'm in the air animation, I can set the duration to something a bit longer, say one second, let's do one second there and back. I'll compile and save this. So now if I play this, you can see that if I jump <laughs> and then go back down, the transition, well, it takes a second now. And it's very, very smooth, which is cool because everything's being interpolated, obviously, but that's just an idea. I definitely want that to be more snappy. So let me just adjust that to 0.1. 
And as I mentioned, of course, it can be dependent on whatever you want it to be dependent on. Okay, so to show you a little bit more about how this graph system works and how this animation system in general works, instead of us using a state machine, let me create something else. Specifically, I wanna create an animation player, which is generally what you get by default if you just import an animation. And this is very simple to understand. This just has an output pose, which I'll now connect to the actual output that we see here and it has an animation asset to play. So if I drop this down, you can see we have, for example, this character running animation. Let me select that. I will compile and save this. And now you can see that this is running. So this is now very simple to understand, hopefully. It's just this animation is playing. There's no logic really to it. It's just playing that animation. The playback speed, as I mentioned, is something that you can of course control. I mean, I was talking about the transition speed, but that's similar here. And to give a little bit of a deeper example, what we can do is we can add an input, say if we wanted the playback speed to be controlled from elsewhere, I'll call this input, let's just call it like playback speed. Let me make this a little bit wider. It's gonna be a float, a default value, sure, zero. And then I'll drag this into here. And now you can see we have an input that we can take in. I'll compile and save this. It's gonna be zero because that's a default value. But where is this input coming from? You'll see now inside the character entity and inside the animation component that we now have a playback speed variable over here that's a float and I can set this to whatever. And that obviously means I don't have to recompile this graph. I can you know, set this to really whatever I want. And this being a normal field like this, means that we can also set it from C Sharp pretty easily. So if you have scripting behavior you want to tie into this, that's also quite easy to do. Now, there are also you know things here like events. So these are specific events that you can trigger when something happens. So every time this animation loops or it finishes, you may want to trigger an event. And this ties into what I was talking about, how you can drive things with animation. So you can actually drive your gameplay with animation rather than you know, having to time things. I mean, no one really does that, but I feel like some people who might not know how this works, they might imagine that animation plays and then you just need to manually like time things together. I don't know if people actually think that. I'm pretty sure I did back in the day. So maybe this is helpful to someone just saying that you can tie in animation events or events inside animation. I could even create a keyframe inside my animation in Blender, which triggers something here. If I wanted it to be like, say, a frame 40 out of a hundred frame animation. I wanted an event to happen in my C sharp and get triggered. I could set all of that up, which is really cool. Uh, talking about this stuff really makes me uh, want to actually use it in a game. I'm pretty sure I'm going to do the London Dare Game Jam coming up in about mid April. So I will definitely have the chance to sit down and use some of these systems. There's so much to explore here. I mean, if we wanted to, we could just go to math and be like, I want to multiply this, like multiply float. <laughs> I want to multiply this by some special number such as, I don't know, the movement speed, for example. And then I want to put that into the playback speed. So if I now hit play and then I move, you can see it's gonna, first of all, move a lot slower because as I mentioned, the movement, the actual character moving, the entity moving is dependent on the animation. That's why you're seeing this but also you can see I can, I can also run and the animation speed actually plays a lot slower as well because it's dependent on movement. As an example, let me change the walk speed to like 15. And so now you can see I'm walking super fast and the animation is also playing super fast. Now, if I hit space to jump, you can see it's obviously, it's never transitioning between animations. This is entirely the run animation. It almost looked like there was two different animations between walking. This is now me holding shift for sprinting, but the sprint speed slower than walk speed. So it looks like I'm walking, but this almost looked like two different animations, but it was all just entirely this character running animation because I'm not using the state machine anymore. But I guess the difference is that it's controlling the playback speed now based on the movement speed multiplying the two together. That's why jumping is not gonna obviously transition to anything because I don't have that state machine, but I'm able to use these inputs together to create this and the entity is moving at the right pace. So you can see the footsteps like line up obviously with the ground and everything is really cool. So yeah, look, hats off to Zero X, really cool system. This is all custom, by the way. I don't think he's using any libraries. He might be using some auxiliary libraries, but all of this animation system is entirely custom written in Hazel. So yeah, definitely really grateful to him. I'm actually super excited to use animation together with some other technology that I will reveal soon. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoy this devlog. Let me know what you thought. As I mentioned, the, these devlogs really, they're as in development as Hazel is. So if you have suggestions, please tell me what you like. Please tell me what you didn't like in this video. Please help me understand how I can better communicate this process of developing a game engine with all of you. Thanks for watching as always, and I'll see you next week with another devlog. Goodbye.